to MIT President Raphael Reif, and all who played a role in conceptualizing Saul. I want you to know that you are doing God's work. Your work is infused with what I believe to be the most fundamental human truth, our interdependence. We have a special name for it in South Africa, Ubuntu. It says a person is a person through other persons. My prosperity is bound up in yours. The task you have set yourselves to better leverage science and technology to address some of the most pressing challenges on our shared earth is as bold as it is timely. You have my 100% support in your endeavors to change the way leaders approach issues such as access to education, digital and distance learning, affordable health care, environmental sustainability, food security, safe drinking water, clean energy, and the future of work in the world. I fully endorse your approach in building a multi-talented team of diverse people and areas of interest, including technologists, philanthropists, business leaders, policy makers, and agents of change. You have the resources, the brain power, the creativity, the collaboration, the courage and the resolve to make a difference. There will be times when you get back to work after the conference when you wonder, but is it really possible to change the world? Is it possible to restore, restore balance to such imbalance, order to such disorder, justice to such injustice? People are working together towards righteous ends create an unstoppable force. Working together, we make the impossible possible. If we could defeat apartheid in South Africa, if we could break down the Berlin Wall, if we could elect a black man as president of the United States, surely we can argue that the sky is the limit. The only turbulence that exists is in our minds. The challenges you are now tackling in education, in healthcare, energy, and infrastructure have intensified for decades, even centuries. They will not be easy to overcome. You may sometimes fail, but the only crushing failure would be if you do not try. When you work on ways to provide access to a quality education for all willing learners everywhere, Think about a curious child in a rundown school with limited resources, forced to do his homework by candlelight. He might end up speaking to a solve conference one day. That boy is me. When you work on ways to bring affordable health care to all people, keep in mind a teenager with tuberculosis, who has a narrow brush with death. Without 18 months of treatment, he might not have survived. That boy is me. I'm living proof that every human being has the potential to reach for the sky, to bring positive change to the world. And so are you. God bless you all. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for the executive producer of Solve, Chris Shipley. Thank you. 
So when we set out to construct Solve, we looked for models where solving had happened in the past. And certainly, when you find someone like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who clearly was an inspiration in the tackling of these very difficult problems, we wanted to have him involved in the conference. But as he said to us, sometimes getting from the living room to the kitchen is journey enough that halfway across the ocean, or across the world, across the ocean was a bit too far. But we were very inspired to have his message, and I see that it resonated with you, so I'm delighted in that. We also found inspiration a lot closer to home here at MIT in the collaborative initiative. And I'd like to spend a few minutes now in conversation with the director of the collaborative, Tenley Albright, who I think will help us take the conversations we had in the first half of this program and begin to think about how we go about the process of solving. So Tenley, if you'll join me, we'll have a conversation. Thanks. Welcome to Solve. I'm delighted you're here. This is so amazing, Chris. I thank you, thank you for getting this all together. Um, the whole concept is the reason I started MIT Collaborative Initiatives. The idea of having experts from very different fields get together, even if it wasn't a topic they were involved with, and put their heads together to break the log jams and remove the roadblocks and, well, and get that's, moving. That's exactly what I want to talk about. I, I, it would be remiss of me not to introduce you a little bit before this audience, although I think you're very well we known. We know each other. We do, that's true. <laughs> Don't mind us for a moment. <laughs> so we could talk about your career as a, a champion athlete. Uh, we could talk about your career as a noted surgeon and a, an academic at, at Harvard uh, Medical School. And those are all fascinating things. We could, we could spend a lot of time here on stage on that. The, the thing that I want to talk about is this third chapter of yours, because I do think it's a place where you and many of the people you're touching are going to have tremendous impact, and where we as solvers can really learn from what you're doing with the collaborative initiative. And maybe you would just start to give us a little context about the initiative, where it came from, and, and what you seek to do there. Well, as a surgeon, I think I was always impatient. I wanted to see research happen faster and wondered what we could do to make that happen and make it more efficient. And then I realized even at the quadrangle, people in different buildings weren't aware of each other's work particularly, and they might be working on similar things. So it just seemed to me I was a strong believer that if you can get people who are experts in their own fields to come and help when there's something that isn't quite reaching the solution and needs a boost and bring them in to bring a fresh perspective that you may have better chance of solving. So um, that's how, that was the idea behind the collaborative initiative. And of course, Bob Langer was a great inspiration mm -hmm. as all of MIT is. Well, that's something that I've, encountered a few times uh, here at MIT and elsewhere where it's remarkable researchers, remarkable scientists who get very focused on their work but feel somehow that stepping beyond that, uh, they don't want to um, impose a perspective on someone else. Um, and that even just thinking about the audience today where we're listening to these amazing uh, uh, doctors and scientists talking about what needs to happen in cure, um, but perhaps if we're not doctors or scientists in, in the field of medicine, we feel we don't have something to contribute. And I'd love to hear some of the stories you have from the collaborative where that total outsider perspective actually was tremendously valuable. Because I think if you're not in learn or cure or fuel or make, you're outside of that, you may feel that you don't have something to bring into those uh, areas. And of course, what we will plan to do over the next few days is really shake that up a bit, and, and maybe you can help us feel more confident in stepping into these other areas. Well, I think there's a lot of confidence right here. But it does seem to me, well, for instance, we always have advisors for our projects who are from very different fields. Uh, Norm Augustine 
um, who was the CEO of Lockheed Martin and, and the former um, Prime Minister of Finland, and a very diverse group. In fact, sometimes when I ask people if they'll join us to in a discussion or round table or taking on a research project, they say, well, you wouldn't want me. I don't know anything about it. And I say, well, that's exactly why we want you. And, um, and it works. And from our first major project on stroke, when people say, well, stroke has been done, but we wanted to look at healthcare and follow something that all the way through healthcare, um, from birth to death or birth to whatever, the end of life. And um, for that, we thought, how do we look at the system? Let's see if we can do this from a systems approach. And that's when we started using architects, engineers, as well as doctors and people from the military and from a wide, wide range. And we found it worked and it came out with something that, um, well, to sort of try to get it out in a few words, what we found was, yes, time is brain. And it's important to recognize that and, and go by that. However, every brain is different. And time for one brain after a certain stroke might be five minutes, or it would, might even be 24 hours. So we were able to encourage, with the help of Dr. Gonzalez, the head of neuroimaging at MJH, the, to do one additional test. It's really the software that is um, very short, doesn't add time or, or um, prevent time from treating on the admission of the patient. And we found that um, when he did grand rounds at Cleveland Clinic, then Toby Crosgrove and, and Mike Modick and the people there said, we want to do that. And so they have several years of results where going by that has actually saved many lives and lowers costs. In fact, Toby Crosgrove, the CEO, said, well, you're costing us money, but we know it's right, so we're going to keep doing it. And eventually it will help the health care system save money. Have you had examples from one of your collaborative meetings where maybe somebody from outside the field, completely outside the field, um, came into a meeting um, maybe on, a, on its particular topic but was able to bring something to that that kind of was, was a big surprise? You and I talked a little bit about serendipity and I'm thinking about what is the role of serendipity in addressing these big, big challenges? Well, we had somebody from... Um, Slumberger, the oil company that has what I call an inside-out MRI because they put an MRI down to see what's there instead of an MRI here to see what's here. And um, he brought a lot of perspectives and things that we wouldn't have thought of because he was not in medicine at all. And we found that we would call on him uh, frequently for this outside approach. Now, I think what's going to happen by the end of these three and a half, four days, I think we're going to find that that the make, feel, cure, learn, and are going to merge. And that's what I'd love to see, because I think what we're hearing about in one of these areas has a lot to do with the other areas, even though it may not be obvious now. But I think we're going to find that, and I'd love to see that happen. It seemed to me that that was beginning to unfold in the earlier conversation when we were talking about uh, prevention, and, and edu which would be potentially an education issue, a learn issue as we're talking about cure. I, I believe in prevention so much. How do you keep the patient from needing to be in the OR? Or how would you get them there faster if you could prevent getting as bad as it is? But then, at one of our new models meetings, we thought, my goodness, it's not just prevention as far as it has to do with health and health care. Prevention in everything. And that certainly applies to all of these categories. Mm -hmm. So I was very heartened by the diversity of questions that we were hearing from the audience and, yes. and even on stage. Um, and it seems that we would signal a, a group of solvers here who are um, kind of very open to that exploration. Um, but one of the things that you talk about with the collaborative that I find interesting is that even as we begin to have all of these perspectives come, come out, that there's this, this potential for what you call log jams. Mm -hmm. And, and a, you have a, a way of thinking about how you clear those log jams, and I was hoping you would share that with us. Well, this may be the group. Um, I'd like to ask, for a show of hands, if people who sat either next to, behind, or in front of someone they didn't know. What a start that is, because that's exactly what we want to see. And 
I really think that um, I am excited about the fact that here we are, like this the most amazing situation for days of going of having this intense, exceptional uh, thing happen, and then. But I, I'm feeling we've got to keep connected. And actually, any connection anybody here makes with anybody else who was here is going to be part of that. But I think it's going to be important to keep the keep the flow going in every way. And I think that. Well, one thing we do in our, um, in our projects is we struggle not to have a hypothesis. I, was, I wanted to ask you about that. You told me the other day that, that that was like taking the blinders off. And it seems that that's antithetical to some of the scientific experimentation that uh, we do to solve these problems. Yes, and, and I was used to that. You know, we want to see if something works, and so you test it. But what we found from the architects and systems engineers and people who are in other fields is, first of all, are you asking the right question? Do you know what the problem is? And backing up to, and they also say, you've got to unpack it, pull it apart. And you need to not think outside the box, you need to throw away the box. And then slowly build up and build up. And for that, in all our projects, we of course spend the first part of time on, the, on our project now on the process of clinical applications to see how we can get the patient to have the medications they need in a more timely and hopefully more cost-effective basis. So um, then we spend the first amount of time in saying, okay, what is the current state? And we find again and again there's so much good work going on, whatever the topic is, across the country, across the world. But very often, well, obviously, sometimes people do connect and they connect at meetings, but very often um, there isn't enough connection or they, we like unique collaborations in that it's not collaborating within your own field. It's collaborating with something that is totally different. And I bet there'd be a lot of different things here. And the good thing is that everybody's come here because they're interested in solving. So what a way to start. We, we are th certainly on the right foot in, in that regard. You know, I, I wonder, just as, as uh, Susan Hotfield said, this event was, was not called wine, and so she, we shouldn't dwell on the problems. Um, <laughs> and we are trying to solve, we also recognize that it is a process. It will take time. We are not in four days, and so this is the expectation setting part of this uh, conference, that we're not going to be able to solve these big problems, pro most probably, in the next four days. It seems to me that our, our mission uh, for all of us is to identify the right problems, so that we're actually yes. uh, in search of problems here as much as we are in search of solutions. Um, and I, again, much experience in, in kind of trying to get to the right problem. How do you, how have you known when you've well, had you, the right problem? Now you're really feeding me something that I would love to say, and that is um, it was a professor at the business school in one of our early meetings where Larry Summers answered questions from the students for about an hour. But um, the message from Professor Tomke was fail often, fail early. Don't wait until you've got something just the way you think and then find out it doesn't work. So I think when we're solving, we mustn't have a fixed idea about what solution means. And we need to be able to um, let it evolve and be open-minded and try very hard. And there's the serendipity. We may, we may stumble on something we never thought would apply. But that's some of the fun of it, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, though, I think if we named this conference fail, we would not have filled this auditorium today. <laughs> we will I, resolve I, I to just, solve. I just have a, a hunch about that. <laughs> so, uh, there's a, a room full of people. You have great experience in, in uh, sort of trying, trying to untwist some of these very systemic problems. And, and as you said, these pillars will come together. I think over these four days, they will come together and come apart and come together in new combinations. And we may think at Solve 2 that we have a very different set of uh, questions and problems and pillars to pursue. But here we are. We're going to start with these. What, what advice do you have for us? I, mean, we, the, I don't think any of us could have listened to 
to Jeff Sachs talk about the sustainability goals or listen to the CURE panel and not think there's work to be done, there are things to do, we must solve, these are, are big ambitions, but how? And, and what, this is the part where I, I'm hoping we can feel, help people feel empowered that we can take on these big challenges and, and we can get started in the next few days and have the, that momentum that takes us from here. Well, Desmond Tutu, make the impossible possible. I mean, that's, that's enough to help us through this overwhelming thing. Um, and I think probably one thing that's scary is to think of solving something for the whole world by, you know, 25 years from now, 50 years from now. That is scary. But I think if we have, as you say, if we can figure some of these things that we feel are important to take on, I think we've got to realize that although we need to have the enabling by having the big group, we also have to respect the individual um, efforts and bring those together. And I, I loved it when Norm Augustine said, well, if you think an individual doesn't make a difference, and one person can't make a difference, think of the mosquito. <laughs> There you and, go. Uh, so, um, and it can be overwhelming. I guess we really need to encourage each other. You have a concept that you talk about with the collaborative, and I, I've heard you say it before, about swelling the wave. Yes. Can you tell me about swelling the wave? Well, we, we don't sort of take ownership. When we, when we do a research project or when we um, are working on something and feel we've gotten to a solution, we don't say, okay, now that's ours. We want to, sh we want to share and we want to connect with other people who with the same interests and I think that's where swelling the wave. The other way to swell the wave is once there's awareness and if we can create awareness of what we want to do here, then we need, in order to swell the wave so that it will be listened to and people will pay attention and will believe it's worthwhile each taking the step to make solve happen, then that's another swelling the wave. One of my ambitions, and I, I don't think it's so secret, is that we create a community here, that we do think of ourselves as solvers and that we have not only the shared goals of the objectives of our pillars uh, and of the desire to change and to, to, um, to solve these problems, but that we become community. And, and I think yes. that's part of that, that wave. Community um, that means, I believe, sort of their values among um, uh, I like the common people, the, 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 a common set of values among the people who've come here. And I certainly have sensed that in a lot of the inbound, even as people have registered or come mm -hmm. into the door today to talk about wanting to be part of this. Um, what, what do you, when you, again, I'll, I keep using the collaborative because I think it is this just great example for what we, how we might swell the wave from there and, and, and evolve into solve. How, how do you sense the, the, and share values in a community like this that allows us to have that connection that you say is so important? Well, one of the things that happened at one of our new models meetings, we had people like Sam Thier and like the head of the military health system uh, um, get up and say, you know, this is great, and they, you know, they wanted. We had a lot of, se of experts who were senior in their fields, and they were calling for change. And then, but Sam Thier and um, and Dr. Woodson said, you know, you don't have enough of the change makers in the room. And so we thought after the meeting, my goodness, that's right. We need to have these marvelous experts who have done so much in their lives connect with what we call rising leaders. So that's why, how we started the Albright Challenge. So instead of saying the, the older people and the younger people, we said the rising leaders meeting with these senior experts. And that has been very interesting. I think that's a very important thing for us to keep in mind too. So I'm very glad to see a real variety of groups here today. I think um, that's one thing that can help 
you know, collaboration. We, we said about solve early on, and I think this was echoed in some of the comments earlier, that these problems won't be solved by a single person trying to own it. That it it's the kind of old solving, the top down, if I spend enough money, or if I research long enough, we can get them done. Uh, that that's not going to, it doesn't have the urgency that we seem to need if we're going to address whether it's the challenges of solve or the sustainability goals, that we have to come to these new ways. And that new way, it seems to me, involves exa exactly that, the, this combining of people, the, the, I, always, I often call them the framers with the doers and bringing them together and, and making those connections. And so it, it's good to hear that that's a validated perspective, that we really do need to break down some barriers. Well, when you think, think of it, um, scientists have always felt that they should, you know, sort of nose to the grindstone and, and do their wonderful work. But the idea of, of advertising it or publicizing it, that just wasn't thought of as something that was appropriate. And, um, and also, they were working in their own field. Now, when the, the Whitehead was the first place that I ever saw, uh, had the stairs that made people connect and, and the internal um, corridors within the labs so that the labs connected. And that's happened more and more and more. And certainly, this is one reason that MIT is the right place for this. Of course, we want it to be every place, but I think this is a wonderful, really quite neutral place. I've actually found that in um, when we have meetings because very often people don't leave their own institutions even if they're across the street. But um, MIT doesn't have a medical school or a hospital, so it's seen as quite neutral, and it reaches out to all of them. Well, I, I do think that there has been a, a, a magnetic kind of convening power here, and, I, and mm -hmm. we haven't shared with the audience, but we have attendees here from 30 countries. Um, we have uh, every continent. If, we could, if anyone is here from Antarctica, then we can claim everywhere. Um, no? It's always a possibility in this place, I've found. <laughs> Maybe um, when some will go. That's right. Uh, and I think that that also helps to bring a, a very global, we, we are here in Cambridge, but also there's a very global perspective, and, and that does make a difference. Well, we're actually doing some of the things with clinical trials in South Africa, in Canada, and Mexico as well. Well, I, we have a very big program, and that means that, that conversations like these, which are so enjoyable, must be uh, brought to an end so that we can move on and, and continue our journey towards solving. But, um, Tinley, I want to thank you for the example that you set with the collaborative initiative and with your, your good and open heart about solving these tough issues. And uh, with that kind of a smile and energy, certainly well, that's contagious. And I'm thrilled thing. that you've done this. I just think it's so huge. It's not a step forward. It's a leap forward. It's a takeoff. Well, that's good information. Infor eh. That is good inspiration. <laughs> there it is for all of us. And thank you very much thank for being you. here. Thank you. We're now going to take a dive uh, into our next pillar, the make pillar, which is really all about infrastructure and jobs in the economy. We've been very, very fortunate to have Rod Brooks, who is an MIT professor emeritus and now the founder and chairman of Rethink Robotics, who has been guiding this since the very beginning, the earliest days of Solve. I'm going to let it be to Rod to introduce our panel this afternoon. So please help me welcome Rod Brooks. With Solve, we're trying to figure out how to make the world for 9 to 10 billion people. How do we make it so that everyone in the world has access to information? How do we build the cities that are going to house all these people that are moving from the country along with the few billion extra who are going to be born? I think we haven't yet pushed the digital revolution into making stuff, making our houses, making food supply, making our supply chains, and increase the efficiency and increase the magic that can lead to better outcomes for the whole planet. So we need to find ways to restructure business so that people can do meaningful work. Not unpleasant work, but meaningful work. 
as we ramp up towards 9 or 10 billion people during the century. How do we bring people together to solve some of the big challenges that are happening in our world? What we need to do with Solve is spark people's imagination that yes, there is a possibility of solving this enormous problem. There is a way we can make a difference, be a central place to bring people together, think what the right questions are, and then work on solutions for those problems. All people can feel that they can be part of the innovation of the 21st century. I'm so excited about this week and what we're going to solve, or at least start to start getting solutions of. Making is something that I've always associated with MIT, and I think lots of people think about MIT as a place that makes stuff. And in the make pillar, we've got four challenges. I'm going to describe three of them, and then we're going to get to one of them right now. Wednesday morning, we'll be uh, meeting uh, and breaking up into four groups, and some of those groups are going to break up into subgroups. We're going to have small groups working together on specific sub-problems, and I hope you can all be part of that. Let me tell you about the challenges that we've got in MAKE. Um, innovation in technology is helped by being able to prototype things, by being able to build stuff and try it out. And if you go back a century, the crucible of innovation here at MIT and other places was the machine shop. Uh, and we still have machine shops spread over MIT. And then places where you started circuits. Later in the century, the crucible of innovation went to become the mainframe, then the PC, then the workstation, and, and then the server. But recently, we've seen a move back to maker spaces where people can build stuff using digital to control the technologies, but largely still building the same sorts of things that we used to build in machine shops and with soldering irons. The technology that we've developed over the last few years should let us build a new class of radical making machines, which is going to let undergraduates, um, faculty, engineers, scientists everywhere, build prototypes of machines that can control biological processes at the micro level, control optical processes, and control chemical processes. And with that base, I think we're going to see lots and lots of innovation in making in maker spaces. So Vladimir Bulovich and uh, Fiona Murray, the co-deans of innovation at MIT, are going to run that uh, challenge on Wednesday morning. Second challenge we have is that three billion people are going to join the consumer class over the next two or three decades. And with them and urbanization of existing people, we're going to have to build as many buildings in the next 30 years as, we've built, as we have built in the world right now. 400 cities have to be built, and that's not counting global warming, flooding lots of cities, and we have to move them to higher ground. So it's more than 400 cities. And even today, building, the building industry uh, uh, produces 30% of the um, greenhouse gases and consumes 40% of our energy. So how are we going to get to our global goals of zero uh, carbon uh, if, if that's all the building that we have to do, because everyone's going to want that building. So Mark Goldthorpe from the Department of Architecture is running a whole bunch of little work groups looking at how to remake the building industry from the uh, construction techniques to the, through the trade level, through the business models, so that we don't have to emit all those greenhouse gases. So for instance, maybe in the future, instead of burning oil to make more concrete and steel, we take that oil as feedstock and turn it into the building materials themselves digitally. Now I mentioned there changing the trades. We see a common theme right now of digital technology changing the nature of work. And we're worried about the middle class jobs being, being, uh, being carved out. So Eric Brynjolfsson, who was mentioned by uh, Jeffrey Sachs earlier, is running a group along with um, Eric Schmidt, the uh, uh, chairman of Alphabet, the company formerly known as Google, uh, uh, and uh, Andrew McAfee and others, to look at ways that we can change work in the future so that everyone can have satisfying jobs. And that's going to change business models. Now, uh, often people 
and I've been one of them. Ah, the technology's going to change, but all the jobs will, will sort of follow along. But I, I, I you know, when the uh, cotton gin was invented in 1793, it made it so one person could produce 50 pounds of cotton a day instead of one pound. That made cotton a worldwide export business for the US, and it meant that we went from 700,000 slaves in 1790 to 4 million slaves by the time of the Civil War because there had to be more cotton grown. And so it's been well argued that without that invention of the cotton gin, we never would have had the Civil War and that slavery might have died off a lot earlier. So technological innovations can have severe, severe impact on societies. That's what Eric and Eric and Andy are gonna be looking at. Everything I've talked about is digital. We can't leave anyone out. And so we're gonna start our fourth challenge right now with Nicholas Negroponte, who's gonna talk about how to get digital to the rest of the world. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna talk in this session uh, about giving everybody access, and I really mean everybody. And just to put that in some perspective, today there are 7.32 billion people in the world, and in the United States, we are less than 320 million people. So arguably, the United States is a rounding error. That really, we are not most of the world. And the very important, think about that and keep it in mind because what works here may not necessarily work there and what works there might be a lesson for us. So it's access for everybody and then just by way of introduction, and from now on, the things I say you don't have to agree with, but I ask myself one question every morning when I wake up, and it is simply, will more normal market forces do what I'm doing today? And if the answer is yes, stop doing them, because normal market forces will do them. In this group, we have the chance to think about and maybe do what normal, normal market forces don't do. And I have been in meetings recently where people sit around the world, uh, around the table and divide the world into entrepreneurs on one side and philanthropists on the other, and entrepreneurs include executives of big corporations as well, and philanthropists can include anybody running a small or large NGO. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute there's a third group they're called civil servants. They're people whose job it is to be engaged with and participate in civic society. And I will, on Wednesday, I won't push it to today, but I will argue that we are at a cusp in telecommunications in the sense of the technology that allows for it and the need that it may become part of civic society's responsibility, and in fact, uh, it may even become uh, a human right. Not sure what happened to this slide, but it got sort of crushed someplace. But it's, uh, it would have shown um, some kids who we had done an experiment in a very remote part of Ethiopia where there was no literacy and the kids had no, they really had never seen words, no adult had seen words, there were no street signs and so on and we dropped off tablets in these villages without instructions and closed boxes and so on and just watched what would happen and they in fact uh, learned how to read. Um, talk about that uh, separately on Wednesday. So I think that connectivity will become a human right and whether you think of it as a human right or a means to a lot of the other human rights um, actually doesn't really matter. Uh, what really matters is that it may no longer be 
simply a corporate opportunity. And it has evolved that way, and a lot has happened because of the commercial sector, but we may want to look at it very differently. And I was one of the people who, in the sort of early Clinton years, uh, was prepared to, I don't, I don't want to say ridicule, but prepared to criticize the term information highway. And the Europeans at the time said, oh, you Americans are calling it an information highway, so typical of you to call it a highway, and we are going to call it an information society. And that's the term the Europeans used. And there was some thoughtfulness to that, but I was interested in going back to the word highway, which might have been misguided at the time. The reason I like it today is that there are certain things we take for granted. We walk out of our houses and we use roads and sidewalks. We don't pay to use them in the sense that we pay our phone bill. They're paid for in a larger mechanism where, if you will, society is elevated. And guess what? We pay taxes. And that's how the roads get paid for. Mind you, people get contracts to build roads. They make money building them. They make money cleaning them. They make money plowing them, and so on and so forth. But it is the civic society that really is responsible for the roads. So I'll be a little extreme, and I will say I think connectivity should be free. And when I say free, I mean it in the sense of roads. Imagine if I came to you, and you're a head of state, and I say to you, I have a solution for the education of all of your children. But my solution is going to be that it's private. It's only private education. And you say, well, no, um, that's not a good idea. And I say, OK, I have another idea. I will make private education for half the children, or let's say those who can afford it, and I'll roughly charge them double so that I can then pay for And you say, well, no, that's not a good idea either, because Really, that's not the way civic society works, and yet that's the way we look at a lot of things that have to do the world of computing and connectivity and making it available to everybody. So I will leave on a note that sort of basically explains how I've organized the next whatever it turns out to be an uh, uh, hour uh, and a bit. I tried to think of how to sort of set the stage uh, with really what are going to be two panels instead of one. Uh, moderator, I've learned in life, don't do things yourself that others do better. And uh, I asked David Kirkpatrick, who's a real pro in this world, to moderate. So I will not moderate. And the first three people are emblematic of the world that at least the world I think I see. And I couldn't have a session on connectivity if I didn't include the man who invented the internet. Now, he's going to use the word founder. He was the founder of the internet. Yes, he's alive and well. It's Larry Roberts. He'll be our first speaker. The second person who ran what I believe to be the most important humanitarian organization in the world as part of the UN, the World Food Program, I said, wow. Please come, because having you and Larry on stage at the same time is a message. And then the third person in the beginning is Marcello Claure, who knows more about cell phones than anybody in the world. He dominated parts of that industry. He's a dear friend. And so I figured, wow, let's get that sets the stage. Then they leave, and David does a second mini panel, and I figured there, who are the new players? It's not AT&T and Verizon, it's not those, it's not Comcast, excuse me if executives are in the room from those companies, um, it's Facebook, it's Google, it's satellites, and so guess what? We have the inventor of the balloon coming, we have Facebook's 
telecommunication whiz kid, and I shouldn't say whiz kid, sorry Yale, you're an adult, but you're so brilliant. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, somebody who, as an entrepreneur, started a satellite company, which goes to show, perhaps, that I think that the way you get connectivity for everybody is to do it from the air, not the ground. And we'll see if you agree with me uh, by the end of the session. Thank you very much. And David, I pass it to you. I don't need it, but thanks so much, Nicholas. I, you know, this, I'm David Kirkpatrick. I'm a journalist, as Nicholas, I think, mentioned. And, uh, and now I, I was at Fortune for many years, and I, I now run a company called Techonomy, which is all about facilitating dialogues in the same area, how technology in particular is transforming the world and gives us the potential to really do things in business and society in fundamentally new ways. And, and before I start my section here, I really just want to say how profoundly this next hour or so reflects Nicholas's passion for this entire arena of connectivity and this idea that the internet ought to be a human right, and he put tremendous genuinely passionate efforts into organizing what you're about to see, and it's going to be quite fun, I think. Um, I also, I just wanted to briefly slightly disagree with Nicholas in his point where he said, it doesn't matter whether you think of connectivity and the internet as the end or the means to the end, because I think you are witnessing and you will witness in this next few minutes something that really is quite different in a sense from what Jeffrey Sachs said earlier today. And I was wowed, I was honored to have Sachs himself explaining this as sort of the father of this whole approach. But there, and I was especially glad though that he said IT and connectivity and digital technology is going to be essential to the fulfillment of these. These are not prophecies, these are targets, and technology will help us get there if we're ever going to get there. And similarly, uh, her name was uh, Kieran mesenber I had to write that down, emphasized that in the medical panel, and I was quite glad that she said that also. But in reality, there are a lot of people who are shocked that one of those 17 goals, if they came up with 17, wouldn't, shouldn't one of them be give everybody the internet? And in the technology industry, and I suspect among you, the panelists, I haven't even asked the panelists here how many of them think that, but I'm shocked. I think the internet is a tool that really needs to be given to people, and that in itself is a goal. But, but the reason it's worth thinking about, and I just want you to have this in the back of your minds as you hear this next part of the conversation, is that there's a fundamentally different philosophy represented by people who believe that everyone ought to have the internet. And Nicholas probably is the leading exponent on the planet of that, although I don't know if he would put it the way I'm about to put it, but I think he probably would, that, you know, the Millennium Development, the Sustainable Development Goals are all about, you know, a top-down UN, most top-down thing we've got, you know, right? It's leaders will do this for society. But people who believe in the internet believe we can do this bottom up. If we give everybody the tools, the people will pull things to them. The people have the power to make the world a better place and the best way to fulfill that opportunity is to give them connectivity. So that's something I simply wanted to point out. Now, as Nicholas said, um, we're gonna have two panels that are gonna be sequential and they're gonna be quite astonishing, I think, I hope. Uh, the first one is gonna talk kind of about the past, present, and future of the internet and of connectivity and what it means. And then the second one will focus more in on what the technologies may be that we need in order to bring literally everyone onto this amazing uh, network that we all use basically 24 hours a day. So I want to start by uh, introducing Larry Roberts who um, is a, has a long history with MIT, and I think you're gonna find has extremely powerful things to say about problems that MIT has solved in the past. Um, and after he was here, where he essentially did invent the internet or founded it, depending on what, how, what terminology you use, he started six companies. He's in the process of starting, I believe, it's the seventh or one of the six? You're starting the sixth now. This guy doesn't give up, Larry Roberts. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with, with the pointing out the fact that it's the environment and the people that create innovation. 
And in the particular case of the internet, it was MIT and only MIT, and that's hardly been recognized, certainly not by MIT in my experience. Uh, the first thing that happened was that the SAGE activity happened here and at Lincoln Lab, and that introduced a lot of computer activity to the environment. <clears throat> there was some communication activity as well, uh, and it, it wasn't what we're doing today by any means, but it, it was something that pe gave people ideas. Professor Licklider, who, who, who was the prof professor who saw the real need for a network uh, in his 1960 paper on man-computer symbiosis, he was talking about the fact that we needed to have people on these big mainframes, is what we had then, be able to work with each other and share information. And of course, all of the programs were not compatible with moving from one to another, so they had to be uh, on the computer uh, in a network in order to do that. There were two requirements that he was thinking. One is the computers had to be time shared so that they could in fact handle multiple users. And two, they had to be uh, networked. Now, MIT had done a lot of work at that point on Project Mac and timesharing, and so timesharing was understood. I had also built a timesharing system at Lincoln Lab on the TX2. So those kind of things were second nature to MIT people. Um, the, his activity then was to talk about that, and in 1962, he wrote a paper about the galactic network, and, and that was, a, a, an incentive to, to many people. Dr. Leonard Kleinrock got his graduate work done here at MIT and, and was encouraged by Claude Shannon to examine the nature of large number of nodes and users and uh, data interacting. And he started his PhD thesis in 59 on the theory of information flow in large communication networks and really studied what we now call packet switching. His, his first paper was published in 61, and his thesis was published as a book, actually, in 1964. So that technology of queuing theory and topology theory and so on was instrumental in, in letting me understand the, the theory so that I knew that this would work, because queuing theory wasn't my specialty, but it basically was required to understand that all of the packets wouldn't fall on the floor when they got switched. And that's exactly the argument AT&T and everybody else used against me when I was selling this to the government, uh, that the packets would fail and they would all fall on the floor. Uh, this was from the teletype age where they had paper tape repeating things and, and that's what they were thinking. In any case, Len did all the theory. He was my office mate, so I certainly absorbed it there. And we all worked together, Ivan Sutherland, Len Kleinrock and I at Lincoln Labs on the TX2, so we knew each other. Ivan went to uh, ARPA to, to replace Lick when Lick, uh, finished with his work at ARPA, where he started working on the timesharing issue and getting universities like MIT heavily involved in timesharing. Um, there were other proposals at that point in time for uh, packet switching. Uh, one by Paul Barron at RAND on a military secure voice network, published in 64, but never funded. And Paul's work was, was uh, plan to be reliable under nuclear attack and produce the rumor that the ARPANET, which I built later, was designed for that purpose. As I and the others involved know, that was not my design goal. And as Perrin's work did not have any of the queuing theory or topology theory or any real theory that I could use, uh, except that this a network should be built. Uh, even when I read it in 1967, it had no thinking about the packet switch networks uh, that I needed to build. So that wasn't particularly useful. Uh, he came up with the, uh, we also had Donald Davies in the UK who started thinking about packet switching after a meeting actually here at MIT uh, that he attended and, and uh, he started talking about it in 65. Well after Kleinrock's work was published, he came up with the word packet, which is actually a UK word 
And when I learned that from him in 67, I used that word and, and it's stuck ever since. Um, but in fact, that was his contribution to what we've been doing. Uh, he actually finished his first local switch in 1970. Uh, he couldn't get any funding from the UK government at that time, but as I'll mention later, uh, that activity might have superseded anything in the US if we hadn't moved fast, because in fact, uh, there was a, a, a lot of people starting to think about this at that time because computers were getting more powerful. Okay, so those are the other two things that it, have often been confused with what happened here at MIT, which was in fact all of the actual threads of the birth of the internet. I was a grad student at MIT at that time, and I went to work at MIT at Lincoln Labs to do my PhD thesis, and I had just finished programming the operating system and my thesis on the TX2 computer when I met with Lick and Professor Corbato at, at a conference in 1964. Lick was talking about the next challenges in the field, and that's uh, an important thing to think about. And we talked about that seriously for uh, a, a period of time. And I got the impression that the network was the next step that needed to happen, and I should start thinking about it because I always like to do things first and make them happen. So in fact, I started working on that. Uh, Ivan was back at, at ARPA at that time, and he gave me a contract to do the first experiment which connected two computers, the TX2 to one in LA, a SDC computer. And what I learned from that experience, that experiment which we handled, which we did in 1965, uh, was that the computers work fine. With the time sharing computers, we could talk to each other, we could run programs on the other machine, we could do everything we needed to do. But the, but the network didn't work at all as far as my dial network that I used uh, was too slow, it was too expensive, and had low reliability. At that time, there were a lot of problems with uh, circuit switching hardware uh, relays making clicking noises that affected packet loss. And the... Uh, and the real issue was that we weren't going anywhere near fast enough for what the computers needed to do. And so it was very slow and, and very expensive as a result. What I realized in that experiment is that what we were using then was about 7% of the bandwidth. Uh, and voice uses about 30 to 50% of the bandwidth. But uh, so it was relatively efficient. Not, not anywhere as efficient as it is on a packet net today, but it was relatively efficient. But for the data, it was hopeless. Uh, computers used that too, too little and too interactively slow. I mean, a, a little burst here and a little burst there, but big bursts and, and then nothing. So that basically we needed to share the communications facilities and we could do that with packet switching. So. That was uh, what I undertook to uh, do in that experiment. And then <clears throat> Ivan tried to get me to come to ARPA and take over the program when he left. And I said, no, uh, I, I don't want to be a manager. Um, and his deputy who took over solved the problem a different way by going to Charlie Hertzfeld and having him talk to the head of Lincoln Labs and having him encourage me to move, uh, which he did. And so through that blackmail process, in effect, they got me to ARPA. <laughs> uh, the result was I took on the program in 1967 and designed the network, uh, explained it to all of the ARPA contractors at the next ARPANET meeting in 67, collected their ideas, and found that most of them didn't want a network they, ha they were so jealous of their computer time, they didn't want to share it. But two years later, they were all raving about what they got out of it. So it wasn't a problem in reality. It was a, it, it was a s small problem. But in fact, what, what one of the things I was thinking is the computers weren't that efficiently used in those days because they weren't used off hours when the other side of the country could use them. They weren't used all the time. And <clears throat> What I uh, achieved through the program of building the ARPANET for uh, 
something like $15 million, that the, uh, I saved three times that in my computer budget uh, because I wasn't, didn't have to buy more computers for everybody. I could start projects just on other computers and they could do that across the country. So in fact, it saved lots of things. And anyway, one of the reasons that I found what Glick Leiter was talking about was so important was that I had had to move a bunch of photos that I had taken to Marvin Minsky and at MIT, and it took me months because I had to buy a tape drive, connect it to the computer, one that he could use, and then drive a tape to him. That was a, a very poor way to do it. So I knew that an always-on uh, network would be a tremendous gain. Now, after, the, after that, um, uh, I basically uh, saw that the uh, ARPANET was a, a tremendous success at that point. Uh, we brought up four nodes in 69. We brought up uh, by 71, we had 21 nodes operating across the country. And it, email, which I actually wrote the first uh, email server, uh, was something that quickly took off to be a major activity. I had not expected personal communications to be that, but of course, personal communications between the scientists is very important. And so it, it turned out to be a major factor. Uh, in traffic to begin with. It's not the major traffic today, but it was back then. Um, the, the, the network kept growing, and it, by the time I left in 73, it was 41 nodes, and finding a successor was somewhat difficult, but MIT came through and Lick came back. So everything done between 1964 and 1975 was MIT's people alone. And it was because of the communication and, uh, and interaction that occurs here that has made it so different. MIT was clearly a leader, leader in, com in computers at the time because of uh, SAGE, because of Whirlwind, and because of the, the MIT Lincoln Lab activity. But it was, in fact, uh, at, at, and Mac, and, and Project Mac. But the, the fact was that it was the environment and the, and the ability for these people to congregate and exchange ideas. And so I went on to build Telenet, the first commercial carrier in, in packet switching, and, and I started the X25 protocol. I wrote it and got it standardized at CCITT. And that domestic service was the only service actually from 75 until 92 for the public. Uh, the ARPANET was morphing over that time to, uh, to pick up my packet radio technology and my satellite technology, which I had designed, and, uh, and it got transferred to NSF and eventually went public in 92. So it, the network got moved forward. And in, in the process, I want to point out that the big difference was packet switching. Circuit switching and packet switching are very different in terms of what they work well for, and packet switching worked tremendously better. Its cost has gone down yearly because of, per packet because of the higher speed lines we use. And it, there are many protocols that have been developed. The first was NCP, which we did on the first network. Then uh, I did X25, then Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn did TCP. Uh, IPv4, Frame Relay was next, ATM was next, and I was heavily involved in that, and then IPv6, which is now the, the future, in effect, because of the address space. The, 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 the important contribution of, we need to. Yep, of them was that they basically uh, standardized it and made it worldwide standard. And so in the future, I think we need to substantially improve the intelligence of the network to control security, speed up throughput, eliminate congestion, and that means more intelligence in the network, not only at the computer edge. So that's where I believe that the, the future of this has to go. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Come join me over here. Larry, Larry, come sit here. So next.
We're going to hear from somebody who's been really knowledgeable about the problems of the world and using technology, among other things, to address them. Josette Sheeran, who ran the World Food Program for a, quite a few years, beginning in 2007, and now is president of the Asia Society. So, Josette, please come out. Well, thank you, David. Hello, everyone. We are all profoundly connected. One of the world's greatest challenges, hunger. Let's think about that for just a moment. How many of you in your own memory of your own life can remember a time of serious hunger? Can you raise your hands? Keep your hands up or, and join in. How many in your parents' life can remember serious stories about hunger. And now let's add in the grandparents. Thank you. So we cannot think of these challenges as belonging to the other. We're only separated really by moments in time and geography from these challenges. And yet hunger is one of the world's most solvable problems. In fact, there's enough to eat in the world for everybody, at least at this time. And yet, as Jeff said this morning, two billion people are malnourished in the world, and more than 800 million go to bed hungry every night. I want to really thank MIT for organizing SOLVE. Having spent many years on the front lines of hunger and conflict, I would literally dream of being able to connect with people like those of you here in the audience to help us figure out how to do our work better. The World Food Program had to reach about 100 million people a year with about over 30 billion meals a year and had all its accounting done in bags of grain when I arrived in 2007. You can imagine everything was accounted for by how many bags of grain moved. It had no barcoding system, had no online inventory system for moving this food all over the world to over 80 countries. Um, and we could not even think about using the internet to do our work better. Literally every grain of rice was counted by hand. And so, and no satellite tracking for our trucks, all of these things. And those dreams began to come true. I just want to thank Nic Nicholas Negroponte, wherever you are. In fact, in my first week at the World Food Program, Nicholas showed up and he said, you know, we have to feed people and we also have to feed their minds. And he brought great ideas, including, you know, how we could bring laptops to kids in Darfur. I really appreciated that. I remember when you and Kofi announced that program, it really sent a shock of excitement through everybody about that. Jeff Sachs, in the middle of the food crisis, showed up at WFP and said, how can I help? He was such a champion. All of these things make a difference, and many technology companies ended up partnering with us to really turn around so that today, much of food aid is delivered digitally in a way that empowers people on the ground and empowers food deliverers on the ground and uh, little shops and mom and pop shops on the ground. You know, I remember a moment when things began to turn. It was 2008, January, and the earthquake in Haiti. And sometimes those moments happen where you realize the world's like changing in a profound way. And I arrived just days after the earthquake and was sleeping in a pup tent on the first night and the ground shook all night and the aftershocks there was about two million people without food, most without any housing, most in mourning for people they had lost. And I finally fell asleep and just shortly after was woken up by this very loud cock-a-doodle-doo from the neighborhood rooster who was just declaring that dawn was breaking. And I annoyedly picked up my Blackberry and typed out you know, a tweet. It was the first public tweet I did and no public officials, at least that I saw, there were about three who were on Twitter at the time. And I typed out the, the dawn breaks in Port-au-Prince, the rooster crows, doesn't he know what's happened here? And sent it out. And by the time I got up 
this had bounced around apparently through the Japanese haiku society and back to Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up and we were getting messages from people trapped in buildings, from the head of an orphanage saying the kids had no food in Haiti. And I remember holding my phone thinking, oh my gosh, people are using this to send signals and messages. And now I recall this because now it seems like, of course, but this is just 2008 and that feeling that this could be a life-saving device and that we could connect even in the most war-torn, conflict-ridden, disaster-prone places in the world. This followed me, and I ended up having Twitter followers all over the world, the villages and the front lines of war, including in Libya, and it became a truth teller. When we would put out a press release saying our food convoys have reached these blockaded cities, I'd get tweets back saying, hey, Josette, they're not here. Where are they? And this became an echo chamber and a lifeline for the world. And same thing happened in Somalia where you know, the phone penetration is so deep. Well, this has moved now to very formal crisis mapping in the world. And I just, you know, organizations like Ushahidi in Kenya, which is uh, Swahili for testimony, which started in 2008 during the elections there to track violence. This has become a much bigger phenomenon, an incredible phenomenon, and also Kathmandu Living Labs, which took the Ushahidi model, took it to Nepal after the earthquake, and they mapped about 9,000 buildings crowdsourced uh, that were damaged, uh, health clinics and, and uh, hospitals and schools. And these are all examples of local br brilliance powered by connectivity kind of the bottom billion for the bottom billion. And I feel like we're, we're really witnessing these emerging new epicenters of innovation from Nairobi to Guangzhou, and seeing how local solutions going to scale and going global. So for example, in East Africa, 80% of the mobile money transfers in the world take place in East Africa. And in Somalia, again, this became a lifeline during the famine there um, a few years ago. I really believe we're at a tipping point where connectivity going viral at the base of the world's economy, even with the huge barriers and challenges. This internet looks nothing like the internet we see here in the United States. More often than not, it's accessed on a tiny little phone with a tiny screen, probably in black and white. And sometimes, with tools like Question Box and others, only one person has access to the internet. They're the only ones maybe in the village who can read English, and they transfer the knowledge via cell phone in local dialects to many, many other people. Or the sneaker network that uh, Eric Schmidt wrote about in Cuba, where kids run UBS sticks of information, become their own virtual network. So as we seek to solve, we have to ensure uh, that this access for all takes in these new methodologies. And also, let's think just quickly about a few challenges. First, these local tech innovators can only grow as fast and far as their ability to connect. Our rest of our speakers will talk about that. It's very, very important. The frustration of the speed and the capacity of these devices. Um, so we, these become the ecosystem for solutions at the, at the, um, out in the villages of the world. Like Jeff did, I warn against the trap of imagined solutions far away from the places that they're being designed for. I call this the buffalo trap. And I will just say that after the earthquake in Pakistan, I went to a small village, Jabori. It had a quarter of a million dollars of medical equipment and, and and uh, services there, no one in the village was using it. So I brought the women together and asked why not. And they said, we just want our buffalo. We keep telling everyone our buffalo was killed in the earthquake. The buffalo provides the milk and the cheese for all the kids. That's all we want. And I asked the UN that was gathered there, you know, who can get them a buffalo? They said, well, we don't do buffaloes. We don't do buffaloes. We don't do buffaloes. 
I gave a speech in Washington and people wrote checks and so the $1,600 to get that buffalo up there was taken care of. But sometimes we have the wrong solution for the problem. And also beware of the wrong technology in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's uh, something that the cook stove syndrome, if you know about that, where cook stoves were delivered all over Haiti to protect the trees but someone forgot that you need a gas supply chain along with it. Um, so this multi-connected world, interconnected world has to be multi-referenced. And so if I could just leave you with a thought, we must put users at the center of our solve solution designs. We must put first their real needs, their real barriers and their real lives. And let me rewrite that sentence. In seeking to solve the world's most compelling problems, we must put technology in service to the solutions and designs of those on the very front lines of these challenges. In all my work in public service, I have a special pantheon dedicated to the problem solvers of the world. I think I found the tribe here, so thank you very much. Thank you, Josette. <laughs> So, if we've, so we've heard that the, the infrastructure was created here by people who were your colleagues in effect, and now we're hearing something about how the world is fundamentally changed, particularly in places that needed change most. And finally, we all know the, the device that is most transformational is this, which we all have, and in our hot, hand, in our hot little hands. And Marcello Claude, come out, Marcello, or get, get ready to come out. Uh, Marcello is the CEO of Sprint, uh, which he's been doing not too long. It's owned by SoftBank. He built a company starting in 97 called Brightstar, which became the world's largest distributor of cell phones, sold it to SoftBank, and then in the effort to try to transform Sprint after uh, Masayoshi Son bought it, he's brought in Marcello, who's doing all kinds of great great things, which he will talk about. So, Marcello Clare. We have a classic, the haves and have nots going on right now. As schools are trying to deploy technology in the school, there's, there's such a gap of kids that, once they leave the four walls of the school, they can't get access to internet at home. So that's gonna have an impact on, on that younger generation as they come up. If they don't have the tools to learn and compete, it's gonna be a generation left behind. I'm one of the few members of Congress and one of the few mayors of major cities that grew up in public housing. I can tell you that today, if you're not online, your life is in decline. So access to technology is at a point in this country where it's as important as shelter, as food. We can't just take it for granted. Everyone has to have access to this. It's important because one of the fundamental challenges for our country is to remain the undisputed land of opportunity in this 21st century. If we want to do that, we need to make sure that everybody has 21st century tools, including access to the internet. The digital divide is getting bigger and bigger. And unless we get involved and do something, this problem will just continue. And these incredible students will continue to be left behind. I've talked to schools and I've announced our program. I've literally gotten standing ovation from administrators from teachers saying this is one of the biggest challenges that we face and for a company like Sprint to come in and provide this solution it's been fantastic. Because of Sprint's efforts and the efforts of our other partners there are tens of thousands of young people that are now going to have access to the internet. I want to thank Sprint for their great effort. At Sprint we believe internet access should be a basic human right. It's critical to a student's success beyond just education. It's critical to their success in life. Yep. Thank you. So it's, it's fascinating to be here at MIT, considering I've, I tried to get in a few times on the undergraduate and graduate, <laughs> and I couldn't, so it's pretty cool to be here standing in front of you. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, a year ago I got a, a pretty cool job to be running one of the largest telco operators around the world, uh, Sprint, and uh, you know, I think when Nicholas invited me to be part of this, I came because I thought we can actually make a change and we can contribute to solving a problem that not, not only exists around the world, but it also exists pretty much in our own backyard in the US. So I'm a huge believer that access to connectivity is not only a civic responsibility, but if we're smart, we can also make it a, a great corporate opportunity. And I go farther to say that it is also a universal right today due to the fact that 
you know, pretty much everything that we do these days is related to be connected, and everything that we do today is related to mobile connectivity. Now, there are some like Nicholas that believe that we should give it away for free, and we do believe in that to a certain group of the population, and there are other people that we should charge for it because it allows them to be a lot more productive. You know, I can personally relate how connectivity has changed and affected people's lives. I'm originally from a pretty small country, one of the poorest countries, Bolivia, in Latin America, and I've seen it through my own experience that the only way children and adults can compete in a less developed economy is by having access to the internet. As I shared with Nicholas the belief when we did one laptop per child many years back, that it was our obligation to provide kids the same type of access to information as other kids or other adults have in developed economies. But connectivity to the internet, to me, it enables parity. It enables everyone, no matter who they are or what they are, to access the exact same information in the same way. And it shouldn't matter if you're sitting in a classroom at MIT connected with high-speed Wi-Fi or sitting around the world with access to a 3G or 4G network, you should have access to the same information. So I believe we have an ability to level the playing field. We got to strive all together to deliver connectivity to all. And in particular, we must deliver connectivity to enhance educational opportunities for everyone. If we want to ensure that rich or poor can lead a happy, healthy, and productive life, it is critical to us that we start with education. It is vital that all young people have the tools necessary to get education and build a successful life. But before I focus specifically on education, if you look at the screen, it basically tells an amazing story of how much our lives have changed. For example, almost all wow. in the U.S. high school students basically says that they need access to the internet to complete their schoolwork outside their home. 73% of people in 18 to 34 have actually found their job utilizing the internet through social network. 72% of users in the internet say that they have used the internet to basically have access to health information. And what's pretty amazing is about 35% of marriages today are because people went online, and there's some people that believe that you can actually, if you use the internet, you're going to find your perfect partner and be able to reduce divorces, which that will be pretty cool. <laughs> now I want to talk about connectivity around the world and where I see some gaps. In some part of the world, telecom infrastructure is less advanced in the U.S. However, mobile networks are essential to connecting to the internet. The good news is that when we look around the world, we see that about 80 to 90 percent of the population lives in area already covered by cellular coverage. Yes, some of the world is still connected by 2G, but everybody's making progress real fast, and you'll see those 2G networks eventually convert to 4G networks, and that's going to be real helpful. But having coverage is not the same as having access. Even though people live in areas that have 90, 95 percent mobile coverage, 67 percent do not have access to the mobile internet. So imagine, to try to put things in perspective, if we had the greatest highway in the world, but we didn't have ramps to access it. If you just watch how cars move, but you couldn't get in. To me, that's just crazy, particularly the urgent need we have to access education through equality. To continue with my analogy, from a wireless carrier perspective, which is what I run now, we know that we can add more cars to our highway, or that means we can add more people to our networks, and that is a fractional cost. And we should be working to figure out how poor and disadvantaged students, how we can give them access to our network in a different way. Now, when we look back, traditionally, when we talk about access to the Internet, we traditionally think of countries outside the U.S. And even though we think that there's over 100 percent penetration in the U.S., just 37 percent of the total adult population in the U.S. doesn't have access to the mobile Internet. When we take a closer look at the situation, we see that basically there are two key groups that are affected. 26% of teens today lack mobile internet access, and the story gets much worse for teens that come from low-income family. 50% of adults that earn less than $30,000 a year do not have access to the mobile internet. And 60, what's really shocking is 64% of adults with less than a high school education do not have mobile internet access. So how do I translate? It's, it's pretty amazing what has happened. If you live in poverty, you're less likely to be connected to the Internet. If you're not connected to the Internet, you're most likely to be a high school dropout. If you're a high school dropout, you're 47 times have a bigger chance to end up in jail than people that have a college degree. So believe it or not, access to connectivity or access to the mobile Internet can pretty much transform many of the kids' lives in the U.S. 
So I like to focus on education, in particular, what I like to say connected education, because I think that's as close as we're going to get to a magic bullet. Without access to educational opportunities, today's our youth are simply not going to make it. So what am I doing? What, what can a sprint do? What can I do in my new job? Even though I not always agree with President Obama, in this case, I agree with him in what he's trying to do with Connected Ed or Connected Home, the initiative to connect 99% of Americans to next generation broadband by 2018. Now, what am I doing? Sprint has pledged over $100 million to provide basic access and connectivity to kids around the US. But I don't think that's enough, right? And one of the reasons why I'm here is how can we solve this problem? How can we provide kids? And what we were discussing with Nicholas, and hopefully we'll work together in this project in the next few days, weeks, is how can a Sprint, we have a network, we have a high-speed network, how can we become the first operator in the world to actually offer free internet access to students? Basically, giving the ability to talk, to text, and to access the web for free while they are students. Now, there's tons of details that we got to work out. Does this apply only to students that are disadvantaged? Does this apply to you know, lower income students? Does this apply, how do we treat the difference between the students that can afford it and cannot afford it? But as we're here today, and we're trying to solve some of the problems, Sprint operates in the US, so this is the area where we're gonna put a lot of focus. And I also think when people say, you know, how are you gonna explain that to shareholders, that you're gonna give away free, free access and one of the things that we believe, and we're big believers, is that connectivity combined can be an amazing opportunity. We believe that if we're able to provide free access to kids, as they graduate, as they get older, as they get jobs, they will always remember Sprint as a company that helps them. And we also believe that parents are gonna look very proactive at a company like Sprint if we're able to provide free internet access to all of the kids that desire. So to conclude, in order to be successful in providing equal access to the internet, we must all work together government, businesses, institutions like MIT, NGOs, to develop innovative solutions to address these challenges. We, from a Sprint perspective and myself, we stand ready to work with everyone in this room to turn this into action and for Solve not to be another place where we just make empty promises. As I said, mobile connectivity to me is the greatest enabler of progress that we've seen, and the magic bullet to us is connected education. I don't think any of us can solve this challenge alone, so I believe we can let our kids down. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcello. I'll take that. That's quite an astonishing announcement you just made. That is truly astonishing. Um, we are pretty much out of time, I believe, or let's see. No, we do have time. Good. All right. So I wanted to ask each of you to talk about what you think the one thing that would best be done to try to achieve this goal of the Internet for All. You've just made a major gesture in the United States. Of course, you also were very involved with OLPC when you were at Bright Star, so you've been involved in extending access globally as well. Uh, I mean, is it, is it changing the minds of the politicians? Is it citizen activism? Is it finding a way to create a new financing mechanism. I'd love each of you to say one thing that you would like to see happen in order to get the internet into hands of more people faster. Not yet, I'm thinking. You wanna think, okay. <laughs> Josette, you're, you, well, what you're a Washington <laughs> veteran, you could do this. What comes to mind for me is, you know, we've done all these things to provide access to medicines and access to kind of vital technologies and, and products through kind of group buying things. And I think if everyone had a phone where they could access the internet to just you know, start at the bottom and not worry about these big, huge structures because people are using phones to pretty much get everything done. And so, you know, my theory always is on places that are closed, systems that are closed, get a phone in everyone's hands. And so maybe we should be, you know, airdropping phones to well, this is people not in, all over the world. This is not entirely <laughs> at all unrelated to what we're going to hear in the next panel. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, that's what they're doing. Yes. Marcella, what do you think? So you need both. Unfortunately, you can only drop phones. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to connect it somewhere. And I think the first thing we got to do is recognize that connectivity is actually a right, right? You know, like people, like we're supposed to provide food for the people that cannot get food for themselves, or we're supposed to provide people access to transportation. 
right? We got to treat mobile connectivity as a human right. Do you think it should have been one of the sustainable development goals? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more that can enable human progress than access to the internet. So, and there's no better way to do it today than utilizing the mobile internet. But the first thing is you got to recognize, and to me, as I was getting ready to come speak here, I look at the data in the US and it was mind blowing to me what happens in a country that is a pretty rich country. So you can only imagine, you extrapolate to what happens in the rest of the world. Yeah, your statistics are very disturbing actually. And, and, and it, I think all of us have to feel, those of us who live our lives on these devices, it's increasingly unacceptable that people simply don't have the opportunity to live the way we have taken for granted. Well, you know, for many in the world, it's not even a toy or a novelty or even just facilitating what they do. It's a life-saving device. And right. you see right now with the Syrian refugees, many, many of them have used this to find safe passage, have used them to find where they can get services, where they can go. So you're seeing a world where, and in Somalia this was true in the famine, you'd, I would meet women who had no food, they had nothing, their husbands had been killed, but they had a cell phone and they were able to find and connect to friends and family. So I think in the world where people are really exposed to a lot of crises and traumas, it's, you know, it's, it is really vital. It's, it's, it's really a matter of but, life and death often. But it's interesting to think, this has not be ma been made a priority of, this, mm -hmm. of the leaders of the planet. It's, a, it's really not on the agenda or the radar to the degree I think any of us would agree it needs to be. And, and there's an interesting side of that whole refugees empowered by mobile phones thing. It could be considered a negative because phones are an empowerment device. And we're seeing in the migration to Europe right now what power it gives people to make intelligent decisions on their own behalf. That isn't always to the interests of the established order. So it's worth keeping in mind, right? What do you think about that, Josetta? Then we get, get to you. Well, you know, I mean, we're talking about parents and their teenagers all having phones. I mean, there's always, you know, an, an amazing responsibility that comes with it and challenges. But I think the world has to wake up to the fact, and leaders do, that they cannot control information and people making smart choices. This is a new world. I remember the first time I tweeted that fear of going through the barrier and exposing yourself publicly, the transparency, and it just seems crazy now because that was just like, you know, a few years ago, but this is the world we're in and people have a right to that information. And I think, um, you know, it's way beyond the ability now of politicians to control that. Larry, what do you think? Well, I mean, it has to be the governments because there's no way for Nicholas's concept of being like the roads without the government underwriting <clears throat> the capability. And I don't know that it's going to be easy for industry to do it because you know, it affects every other carrier, and it affects the whole system. The government has got to do more if, they're going, if we're going to get there. The U.S. did it with electricity back in the day when America wasn't wired. You know, we made sure with the rural electricity that it was. But we have to start somewhere, right? Because if all we do is we leave it to the government, it's no. just never going to happen. I, I mean, agree. period. <laughs> so I think sometimes, you know, it takes a leap of faith. It takes companies like ours to basically, in my case, to basically say, hey, why not provide free connectivity to students in need? Well, hopefully that makes others follow and then suddenly you start a movement. And a lot of people will look at what the U.S. is doing. If the U.S. that has the country with one of the lowest poverty indexes does something like this, then everybody will follow. But again, if we just say, hey, it needs to be the government or an NGO, then you know, we'll be sitting here in 10 years anniversary of Solve, and we're going to be facing pretty much the same. Well, for the, for the students, that works, because <clears throat> what Apple did with putting apples in schools way back was very effective, mm -hmm. and it didn't upset anything. It, it, was, it was effective for the company, and it may be for Sprint to do that. But, but it's, it's very hard to see how we got, go much further than students otherwise. Unfortunately, we have to wrap and move on to the next section, but thank you all for being here. Thank you for giving such powerful messages. Thank you. Really good. <laughs> thank you, Larry. Okay, so we're going to continue in a similar vein. Uh, only with a little more of a techie geek edge, but it will be very interesting because we're about to have Facebook and Google on stage talking about their internet connectivity activities, which is very, very unusual. It's happened once before, but 
I think we may take it a little further. Uh, so we're going to start with um, Yale McGuire from Facebook, uh, who is one of two consecutive PhD graduates of the Media Lab who will be speaking in this next section, uh, and they were in the same class to boot. So Yale, come on out. I'm going to hand you the clicker, and you're going to get started. Please, Yale. Awesome. Thank Yale, you. of course, is at Facebook and internet.org. Great. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, oop, let's go back. So um, at Facebook, I lead a research and development organization which is trying to achieve uh, part of what Nicholas talked about, which is that we want to connect every single person on the planet. We think it's an extraordinary task. It's part of the reason why I'm here is to help figure out how we can solve it. But the first thing that we did at the company when we were trying to look at this problem, how do you connect everybody, is we wanted to understand what does the state of connectivity look like. If you go to the ITU and you ask for, by city, by region, a state of connectivity on a daily basis, that's how we are used to solving problems. You can't get it. You can get it by country on an annual basis. So, we had to start to try to really understand this problem, and I'll get to why we needed to do that. So we started with some data. We're a data-driven company, and we produced a map that you can see behind you here. And this is a map of showing uh, LTE connectivity. So if you pulled out your phone and tried to connect to a network, whether it's Sprint or any other network, you'd probably connect via LTE. That's this green you see in the United States and parts of Europe, uh, Japan, and Korea. And then 3G is blue. I haven't shown you 2G connectivity, because we don't consider that adequate connectivity. Even though we know 90% of the world has access to 2G networks, if you pulled out a 2G phone and I asked you to, to download one of 1,000 of top websites around the world, it would take you anywhere from a half a minute to six minutes to download that website. That's the kind of connectivity that we're asking people to use outside of this country and emerging markets. We just don't think that's adequate. We don't think it's, it's fair to expect that we're going to try to create a connected world where people are using technology that's 30 years behind. We have to do better. And so this is the map we have. So even though there's lots and lots of um, users in India, for example, the amount of connectivity they have relative to the per capita is, is really, really low. So, and in fact, as you dig into this, and this is more uh, an aspect of physics and just where people are located, if you look at the most rural billion people of the 7.32 billion that Nicholas mentioned, compared to the most urban billion people in the world, they take up 85 times more land area than those most urban people. From a physics perspective and thinking about radio propagation, because all networks are going to be mobile, that's an incredibly challenging problem. And it's also challenging because people who live in those rural areas are also typically poorer than people in urban environments. So it's very, very challenging to think about how we can do this. So we started a research and development organization to try to tackle this problem of how do you find and figure out technologies to connect everyone. We, the, the punchline is we don't think there's a silver bullet. We actually think that it involves a number of technologies. And I'm just going to talk about one of them today in a little bit of detail and then touch on uh, one more, which is on the satellites. So if you go from cities where there's a lot of terrestrial development that's happening worldwide, hundreds of billions of dollars of investment uh, to do that, we think there are other opportunities to try to connect people that live in suburban and extreme rural environments. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time very quickly to talk about UAVs. Drones. Like. UAVs. <laughs> Haps, high altitude platforms, but not drones. So what are some of the key ingredients to be able to make something that is effectively geostationary? It is focused where people are and will provide uh, access economically. So we think there are three ingredients. First is it has to be solar powered. The cheapest fuel to make this possible is the sun, we ha similar to satellite technology. So we need the system to be solar powered. We also need it to be at altitude above commercial aircraft, above weather. So this is above 60,000 feet, 18 kilometers. And the other key important uh, metric which in order to make this economically viable is these aircraft need to be in the air for at least three months, ideally uh, years or more. So these are some of the key ingredients. So we have embarked on designing an aircraft. Uh, we did this, started this about uh, 16 months ago. And the aircraft on your right is the aircraft that we have. It's named Aquila, which uh, is Latin for eagle. Uh, for flight. And this is a Boeing 737 on your left. Um, 
that is sort of the comparable size of these aircraft to be able to make this work. But in terms of mass, the Aquila is about a third of a Toyota Prius in mass in order to be able to pull off making something that is solar powered that can operate for months at a time. Um, this is a picture, also it got garbled a little bit, of the aircraft in our hangar in the United Kingdom. Uh, we just uh, finished this a few months ago. So I looked up on the internet that Kresge Auditorium is about 124 feet wide. This aircraft is 142 feet wide, so it would not fit in this auditorium. That's to give you a sense of the oh. scale. Uh, this is just a quick video of it operating um, where we turn on all the propellers for the first time, and you can see the people relative to this. So this is a carbon fiber aircraft. It's incredibly light, and it's, it's really uh, fun to see it uh, operating in real life. The propellers actually go at about 10 times this rate. They can't um, operate that fast when people are around. Um, so just actually, just quickly to close, um, so I just gave you a little bit of a glimpse of the UAV efforts that we're working on. We also have an active program around laser communications because you have access to tremendous amounts of free spectrum to be able to provide gigabits and hopefully ultimately terabits of capacity. So we're working on developing uh, essentially a backbone in the sky that would connect these aircraft. And then just to close on the satellites, because that's also an important piece of uh, this, we actually just announced, in order to try to uh, address the buffalo effect of really not what we're knowing what we're doing and are we developing these technologies without the context of where they should be delivered, we've actually just entered into a partnership with uh, UTELSAT, a uh, satellite provider, to provide geocapacity over sub-Saharan Africa so that we can start to learn. We don't believe that this is the end solution to connect everyone, but it is a way for us to learn and uh, commit to our objectives of trying to connect the world. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Yale. Really good. So, Another MIT PhD who does something quite similar or closely related at Google, uh, Rich Duvall. So Rich is formerly was a, a black ops at Apple uh, and is an entrepreneur in his own right and now has been at uh, Alphabet, formerly Google, Google X, X Labs, whatever it's, it's called. All, it's all very complicated, but thank you. Hi, my name is Rich Duvall. I have the very best job in the world. I lead the early stage innovation team at Google X, no, wait, at X Labs, <laughs> which means that I get to come up with crazy new projects. Our team's job is to come up with new moonshots. And I'm here to tell you about one of these, which is Project Loon. So, connectivity, big, big problem. How do you think it would, it would be to walk into your boss's office and say, hey boss, I've got this great idea. I'm gonna connect the entire world by means of high altitude balloons. How well do you think that conversation would go? Actually, it might go better than you think, and hopefully by the end of my talk, I'll, I'll give you some tips on how to do that. So our huge problem is global connectivity. And while we love satellites and we love high altitude drones, we actually think there might be a cheaper and faster way to connect all of the world's people, which is with free-floating stratospheric balloons that provide LTE straight to the phone that is currently in your pocket. Uh, like our colleagues at Facebook, we think that LTE is the right solution, and we want it to be absolutely everywhere. So we want to actually, in some sense, put a band of balloons all the way around the world that actually connects everyone on the ground. So moonshots combine some huge problem, like global connectivity, with a solution that we can deliver that needs to be 10 times better than anything else through a breakthrough technology. And in this case, this is really almost two technological breakthroughs. They're closely related. One, there needs to be a revolution in balloon science. Balloons are very, very old, but we need balloons that last a really long time, that are very cheap, and whose altitude we can, we can control. It turns out that conventionally you get to choose one of those. And we need to take a $5 million NASA science balloon and make it for about 500 bucks. And by the way, we did that. Another problem we had to solve was that we had a huge planning problem, envisioned tens of thousands of balloons circling the Earth, drifting in the winds. We control those balloons by moving them up and down. We need to guide that entire formation of balloons to where the internet needs to be on the ground, and we also need to keep them close enough to each other to maintain constant coverage. That's a super hard planning problem, but it turns out that we can solve that too. 
So what do these, what do these balloons look like? This is a schematic, of course. Essentially, it's a satellite. It's actually probably, the guts are very similar to what's in your UAV, um, except that rather than having that great big 142 foot long wing, we have a balloon that might be 90 feet or so in diameter in the stratosphere. But it's got solar panels, it has to last a long time, it solves many, many of the same problems. I'd love to tell you more about the details, but I'd rather show you a few pictures and then kind of get to my central point about how we solve these problems. So in 2013, we actually announced this project to the world in New Zealand. And we did it by flying a whole bunch of balloons and providing the internet to Christchurch. Right? So we actually didn't just say, hey guys, crazy balloons. We went and showed this was a, a possible thing. And by the way, after the balloons were in the air, then we asked permission, oh, is it okay if the balloons overfly Chile? Uh, you know, asking in advance might not, have, uh, might not have been quite as cool. But anyway, so this works, by the way, our balloons, they're I can't tell you how many balloons, but perhaps hundreds are in the sky right now over the Southern Hemisphere. We expect to be providing service in the Southern Hemisphere, oh, we'll say maybe 2016-ish. Things are going really well. And so another view of what our stuff looks like here, you see you know, beautifully manufactured payloads, well, in progress of being manufactured. Uh, that turbine there is a special thing that allows us to put air into our balloons or let it out to control their altitude. The, the balloons have helium in them, but we, we pressurize them with air to change their density. Um, so this is actually kind of how things look right now. This is 2013-ish, but honestly the design hasn't changed that much. What I really want to tell you about is sort of how this project started, okay? I could have funded the start of this project out of my own pocket because it really only cost a few thousand dollars of equipment to show that essentially this could work. Everybody said this is not going to work. The connectivity will not work. We got some tanks of helium from Madco, our local welding supply. We got some duct tape some GoPro cameras, some Linux computers, and Wi-Fi, and we showed this was possible. And I believe it's this kind of hands-on attitude of going out and tackling problems that's absolutely essential to solving the great big connectivity challenges of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Really good. Please sit. And now, finally, Mark Danberg is the CEO of a company called Viasat, which has been doing stuff like this for quite a long time. I think he'll tell us details. Yes. Vitas and I will probe uh, further when he sits down. But Mark, I'm gonna hand you this. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Mark Danberg. Uh, I was one of the founder and CEO of Viasat. And we're a satellite company. And as of a few years ago, we set out to actually uh, solve what we thought was the really big problem with satellite, which was how do you get bandwidth? How do you, how do you get a lot of bandwidth? How do you measure that and make it affordable? Because whether people pay for it or somebody gives it to them, you're totally motivated to get the lowest cost you can. There's no benefit in paying more for bandwidth than you need to. So one of, one of the things when I always think about really, really hard problems is I always remember this line from Will Rogers, and hopefully one of the things I'm gonna be able to do for you all is, is tell you a couple of things that you thought you knew that really weren't so. And one of the things in order to solve a, a problem like this is I think it needs to be really well defined. And it's, it's a hard technical problem, it's a political problem, but fundamentally it's an economic problem. And you need to know what it is that you're trying to do. And turns out measuring it is difficult. Uh, w one of the measures that we really like is to think about what you're trying to accomplish. Remember, we're talking about billions of people, so you're going to need terabits per second of capacity, of bandwidth, to be able to do deliver to that. Those terabits really only count when they're over people who can use them. So putting up terabits and putting it in places where people don't live, uh, it, it's technically challenging, but you don't score a lot of points for that. And finally, if you're gonna invest billions of dollars to do this, you'd like it to have a lifetime that's worthwhile. So think about terabits, people, coverage, how many people you cover, how long that lasts, and then divide it by the amount of money that it takes to do it. And that's a really good metric of, of what you're trying to achieve. 
One of the things that got us excited about space, we had worked in satellite technology for a long time, providing networks for other people's satellites. And one of the things we realized was, wow, there is, and I'll show you pictures of this, there is room for enormous improvements in the way satellites provide connectivity. So if you look back, uh, the, the one on the left there got caught up a little bit, but that tells you basically how many gigabits of capacity bandwidth you can get with conventional satellites as recently as about six or seven years ago. And it's just a handful of gigabits per billion dollars. Now, those gigabits last 15 years, but that's pretty, it's pretty good life. It's not really cost effective in solving this problem. Think of that as a bit, a bit per second per person. So uh, we, one of the things we did is about uh, five years ago, we, four years ago, we launched a satellite uh, that we designed ourselves, which created two orders of magnitude improvement in the effectiveness of, uh, of, that, of delivering that bandwidth. So we were able to get hundreds, over a hundred gig, you know, it's actually hundreds of gigabits per second per billion dollars. That, that was a big bet for our company. We bet about a billion dollars to do it. It's worked out well. A few years ago, we started another satellite. I'll show you pictures of what that'll do. But that'll provide about double the bandwidth uh, effectiveness as uh, Viasat 1. And what we're getting close to being able to do, is still technically really, really challenging, is to deliver multiple terabits, getting close to 10 terabits a second that would last 15 years per billion dollars of investment and be able to do that on a global basis. One of the things, we, there are all different kinds of satellites you've probably heard, there's some that are called geosynchronous. Those are 22,000 miles above the Earth. There's some that are called low Earth orbit. Those are about 700 miles above the Earth. One of the big questions now, the advances in technology, what should we work on? And framing the problem is a hugely important element. So one of the things that's really interesting about this, and it's pretty counterintuitive, is most people would first think that hey, the closer you can get to the Earth, the easier the problem is. But actually, when you think about it, and we've heard this already twice, is what we're talking about is turning solar energy photons, and we're end up in space, where the space is 100,000 feet or 20,000 miles, we're going to manufacture bits. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to take solar panels, turn photons into electrons. You turn that, those electrons into power flux density on the ground, and then you turn those into bits that can change people's lives. Well, it turns out that it doesn't really matter how high up you put those platforms in terms of getting power flux density on the ground. It's the same. The there's a, one effect called path loss, which is a lot lower when you're close to the Earth, but there's another effect called the isotropic antenna gain, which is a lot better when you're much farther, farther up. So at the end, you can do it either way. The big issue is, is the usefulness of those bits. And so one, one of the things is if you look on the side on the left, with three satellites that are really high up, you can see the entire world everywhere. And you can put the equivalent of cells or little spot beams everywhere on the world. And then, depending on whether or not there's people there, how many people there are, you can put bandwidth in those spots. And you have tremendous flexibility. The issue is as you get closer and closer to the ground, you have to be a lot more careful about where you put your bandwidth. When you do something like satellites that orbit the world, you have to space them out evenly, and it turns out that most of those satellites aren't where most of the people are. And you look the, there's a difference in those little circles. The ones on the right, those are the footprint of the satellite. So even if you put lots of little beams and have the flexibility to move that bandwidth around, you can never move it outside of the circle that it sees. So a lot of that bandwidth wouldn't fit one of those criteria that we talked about, which is putting terabits where there are lots of people. Now, if you want to make geosynchronous satellites that can make thousands of beams and deliver terabits of capacity, it turns out you have to totally rethink the way satellites are built. And this is what got us excited about the opportunity to invest the amount of money that we have in this technology. And what you're seeing up there on the left is basically the communications payload for the Viasat-1 satellite, which was the one that had that two-order magnitude increase in bandwidth. And if you look at it, it looks like microwave electronics from the 1980s. 
the, pic the picture in the lower right is basically waveguide. That's the way it's mechanical uh, cables and waveguide that moves those electrons and radio waves from one part of the satellite to another. That provides 70 of those little beams, and there's no way you're going to get from that type of technology to the types of satellites that we talked about. So the big thing you have to do is totally reinvent that technology, which is, we feel, a big opportunity. What we think will come up at the end, and hopefully we'll, uh, as I mentioned before, we'll get the first one of these up uh, in 2019 over the Americas, is covering the entire world with terabits of very, very flexible bandwidth, which would allow governments or other organizations to deliver that to people in ways that have never been imagined before. We, uh, I mentioned that our next satellite, Viasat 2, launches next year. That satellite covers a lar basically all of North America down to uh, the coasts of Venezuela and Colombia, all of the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, at very, very cost-effective bandwidth. Uh, we can move that bandwidth around. We could bring it all back into the U.S. We're now using it, uh, or, or Fisat One, to deliver Netflix on airplanes. Uh, it's pretty, it's uh, actually a good way to pay for the other things you want to do. But we're looking for opportunities in the footprint of this to be able to start testing some of these concepts. We do, I mentioned we do satellite networks all around the world. Uh, this is some pictures of a, an experiment we did uh, end of last year in Africa with an organization called RASCOM, which is an association of all the governments of Africa. And what they're doing here, they're taking very old satellite technology. Tenths of percents of the bandwidth we're talking about with these new ones. But they are connecting people who have cell phones in remote villages. This is in the DRC, in a village that was miles and miles away from the nearest cell phone tower. Within days of erecting a cell phone tower connected by satellite, we had thousands of phones registered on this network. Not being able to do uh, the internet, but really being able to do voice and texting, it was incredible to see what the demand is. And that's what we see as the exciting part of trying to move that technology ahead. So thanks very much. Great. Please join. So, so, so Mark, so you're basically not broadcasting directly to individuals. You're broadcasting to a, 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 hot spot. a, a signal and a center of reception and then rebroadcasting re to a cell phone signal. Yeah, basically yeah. The, the best way to do it is going to be through Wi-Fi hotspots because right. Wi-Fi is unlicensed and free. Okay, so what about the balloons and the drones? Are you going direct or are you going to go to you know, central repositories and then redistribute on the ground? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I think that satellites are great and we, we love that you're working on, on satellite connectivity, but we really wanted to connect directly to the devices that people have in their hands. And all of you out here in the audience who have an LTE phone, your phone could talk directly to our balloons, and in fact, you wouldn't even know that you weren't on your conventional terrestrial network. Really? And that's, and that's one of the things that we, well, Maybe you would know because a little balloon icon would pop up or something. That'll be up to the carriers. Um, and, and we are looking for partnerships with carriers, by the way. Um, but, but yeah, that's the plan. We are, we are going to go direct to the phone in your hand. And what about you, Yale? Uh, we actually are pretty similar to the Viasat approach just because um, uh, we think it becomes challenging, especially if you want to have high data rates back and forth. If, for example, people want to go in their homes or other buildings and things like that. There's a big path loss that exists between the outside of a building and the inside of a building. And so I think it, it can work when you're outside and you've got your handset in your hand and you're connecting. But if you want to you know, sit down and you know, whatever you want to do, it, it, it can be a bit challenging. And then on the ground, it could be either cell phones or Wi-Fi. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrestrial redistribution is, I think, uh, a very a very good idea to do. Okay, now, Wi-Fi or LTV. I don't know as much about Viasat, but the, you two companies are fairly widely attended to by people like me. And you basically have both said corporately that you don't expect any near-term financial return from these kinds of, the long-term thing. Okay, so the question I'm sure is in the minds of me and most people in the audience is, how come you don't all get together and work on it together? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, I, uh, I don't think we can get into the details, but 
you shouldn't presume that we're not already working together. Good. I was yeah. glad you kind of hinted at that before we got up here. And, yeah. You know, I think I think something that hopefully you've seen on stage here is that we're pursuing some really complementary approaches. And I think we all have a vested interest in seeing each other succeed, right? We're not going to close that global connectivity gap, which is, you know, whether you count it as three billion people or four billion or whatever it is right now, we're not gonna close that if in some sense we're, we're, we're locked in combat with each other's hands around, around our necks. So this is all about, you know, we're all working together in some sense to bring this connectivity to the world. And I'm actually really excited about uh, the future collaborative possibilities, as well as perhaps a little, little friendly rivalry along the way. Well, all of that works, but the, the co collaborative is certainly something the world is, is hoping for, I think. Yes. Yeah, um, but, and, but there needs to be as many ideas as possible, right. I, think. There's, I think. There's a shortage of good ideas to try to go and actually solve this. Yeah. So. Well, it, it's impressive that these are three quite different, but very aggressively pursued avenues right now, and I think it's great that Nicholas got all three of you up, but, but you, you all three could take elements of what you've each described and build an integrated system, huh. potentially, and I'm not arguing for that right now, but all these things, especially what you do, could be potentially paired with what either of these guys do. Sure, right? yeah, yeah. Well, if, if we do our terabits, we'll have single digit percents of all the bandwidth in the world. So let's keep that in perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then what people are gonna wanna do is they're gonna need to get access to data centers, use the bandwidth. So we, we've, we do cooperate with, with each of these companies. Well, well, you know, let and me... let's not forget the contributions that Larry made. IP connects everything, right? So <laughs> yeah. regardless of what technology yeah. well, it, it is. It is amazing to me what Larry was saying about MIT back in the day and then to realize that the guys, and they happen to both be guys, but at Facebook and Google who are heading these super creative initiatives to expand internet access globally are also both MIT graduates and, and PhDs here. But I you think know, it's if we're successful in five or 10 years, the stage will probably have a bunch of folks from the IITs, from the other parts of the world that are being profoundly enabled by, by this technology. And to me, that's what's so exciting, is we've had yeah. this concentration of information resources in one very small part of the world. And don't get me wrong, there's, there's the, the Charles River is in fact magic, and there's a lot of, you know, sort of really kind of important stuff that happens here, but at the same time, I feel like we've been leaving out these billions of people and soon they're gonna be part of the conversation. Well, that's super exciting. I think one thing that's come through in this, this whole segment has been the urgency yeah. of this problem. And you know, I think particularly Marcello's numbers about you know, what a different life you get, even in the United States, when you're connected. And this is certainly even more so in, in parts of the world where it's from zero to 60. So how soon do you guys who are professionally doing this day in and day out think we might actually get there? I mean, how? What kind of timetable should we be thinking about? I mean, these are great experiments, and you guys are spending a lot of money in both your companies and in, in, in your company too. But, I mean, are we, are we gonna be, how soon? You, you have a corporate target. Yes, I mean, uh, our CEO has uh, stated that. Who is that? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg uh, stated that uh, we want to have everybody connected by 2020. I think that's a very <laughs> ambitious goal. When he says that, does he mean using the systems you are, are developing or just that it will happen the, by then? I mean, the world is going to progress at its own pace, right? And yeah. what we hope to be able to do is contribute to changing the rate at which people adopt. Yeah. So uh, I think you can, you can already project ahead in what's going to happen. And, I think we all want to tr figure out how we can add to that so that everybody is connected. But that would be a rapid acceleration in the connectivity rate, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, yeah, that. yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a very ambitious goal, I think. And what about, does Google share a common goal to that? Um, I'm pretty sure that if, if our founders, if Google's founders were standing behind me right now, they would be hitting me to stop me from making any commitments. <laughs> um, but I can also tell you they're both incredibly ambitious people. And if I walked no. into Larry's office and said, hey, Larry, you know, I think we can do this by 2020, he would say, why not 2018? Yeah. Um, so, so I think that you know, as a practical matter, it is years away, yeah. but how quickly we get there depends not just on us, but it depends on you, it depends on the political leadership around the world. Yeah. You know, our balloons can't go places where they're not allowed. Right? We have overflight permissions nearly everywhere. Your drones can't fly, I'm sorry, UAVs can't fly where they're not allowed. So, yeah, no, so, the regulatory. so this is regulatory and policy are really, are really big issues. Yeah. So, so that's really what we need to work on to solve this issue. It's not just technology, it's 
And it's not just attitudes, it's actually laws. And it's, it's national regulations and national attitudes. Yeah, um, I, I remember uh, somebody relayed a conversation talking about aviation policy, which affects what we're doing on UAVs. And they came out of the meeting super enthusiastic. They said, this is great. I think we can get this policy done, and it'll take about 10 years. And we were like, this is just in one country or? Yeah, no, this was, this was, a, this was a governing, a international governing authority okay. that was trying to think about policy around this. And we were like, 10 years? Like, that's, that's crazy. And then World Radio Congress, which, you know, the I2 uh, runs, they meet every three years to set radio regulations. And that's another time scale which is incredibly slow. Anachronistic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You and I have been at ITU meetings together, and they're not moving very quickly to deliver this on this goal. That's right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think we can all do demos and, and test these things out in markets with temporary licenses and authority, but how do we actually turn this into a global policy that's going to try to enable these solutions. Well, I'm sure all three of you have thought a lot about this. I mean, what is a way to build this ecosystem faster? I mean, is it just lobbying? Is it about the, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Larry Pages of the world going and meeting with heads of state? Is it, I mean, is it about U.S. national policy changing from a development point of view? Is it about making one of the you know, sustainable development goals? Or, I mean, what, what's going to push this thing forward? Boy, well, I mean, one of the problems, and you see this, you know, even 60 Minutes did a segment on it, is space is power. That right now, space is power. That is the way countries look at it. And so a lot of countries don't want other countries invading their space because it inhibits the development of their own space program, which they believe to be extremely important. And you've seen like India landed a probe on Mars, right? An enormous national accomplishment, which may not have occurred if they had ceded their space program to others. So these are, these are really, really complex issues. It's pretty, it's a little bit hard to snap your fingers and, and come up with a resolution, even with, you know, heads of state that are very, very motivated to provide con connectivity like this. So they see your company as sort of an imperialist. Not our, not our uh, company, yeah, not our company. It's just that they feel like they want to have their own, ro they do have their own rocket program. They build their own spacecraft. And so if they don't protect that market, uh, another country's come in it will inhibit the development of their own space program. That's for earth sensing, for positioning, everything that you do from space. So th those, are really hard, those are really hard problems. So, I mean, there are, I think there are a lot of important policy issues. There are certainly issues of kind of national sovereignty and what you know, vested interests you know, have in terms of issues on the ground. But one of the things I'd like to point out is that business models really matter. I mean, for example, with Loon, um, we don't, even though we have a really nifty free space optic system that we're developing for air-to-air -air communications, we're not going to provide a backbone service. And the reason for that is that means that we have to rely on partners on the ground to actually land our data, which sounds like a flaw. It's actually a huge advantage because that means that the local telcos, the local ISPs, see us as a way to connect to new customers, right? And by structuring the business model of Loon such that everywhere we would go, we would have friends because everywhere we would go, people could win and could benefit from it, not just the end users, but also the entrenched communications interests. It's, it's, it's tremendously accelerated what we've done. Well, there's an analogous approach at Facebook, wouldn't you say, or, or would you not? Yes, uh, we definitely want to figure out how to be open with the technology. There's a long history at the company uh, through uh, Open Compute uh, Project, for example, where all of our data center technology, compute technology, networking gear, we've opened up uh, to the community just because we found enormous opportunity uh, in collaborating, being open uh, to collaborate on technology. So we want to take the same approach with um, operators as well, whether they're satellite operators or terrestrial operators or hopefully in the future UAV operators. But we want to make this technology open so that others can figure out new business models and uh, and in fact, there's it. another big piece of internet.org at Facebook that involves collaborating very directly with carriers on the ground, which could dovetail with your part of internet.org, right? That's right. And so there is this very serious effort at Facebook being made to provide economic incentives and, and assistance to carriers in less developed parts of the world to really give them tools to bring people faster onto their network. Yeah, I wouldn't say economic incentive, but I would say just new business models, right? New yeah, business models new business by which model. people can get access. Absolutely. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> um, that clock is scary. Uh, 
Well, I'm curious, you know, it would have been nice to have time to get an audience. Uh, maybe, is there anybody in the audience who has like just one burning question? I'd love to know. Okay, right there? Okay, that was good. You're sitting in the front row. Can we, do we have mics or, do you, okay, go to this and give it to us real fast. I think probably a lot of people are asking the same, are thinking the same question, but how do we balance our, our, our desire and need for internet connectivity with our innate desire for security as well? And where are these, where are these lines going to be drawn in the sand? Okay, very like briefly, unfortunately, because it says 10 seconds there. Uh, <laughs> but, but do you guys think a lot about that? Yeah, Rich, explain. Um, yes, excellent question. And we're putting a lot of effort into both secure networks, how we secure our little balloon-like satellites, et cetera. So there's a tremendous amount of effort that's being put into this such that it's a lot harder for a third party to eavesdrop on the conversation or compromise our stuff in the air or on the ground. You guys think about it a lot? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is quarter of business that we have to protect the uh, interests of our users. We're pretty we good just, at that security stuff over there. We, yeah. we, we, we try very hard to be good at that. And you know, we have an international footprint, global footprint for this technology. So there are people in the organization who are studying this all the time and trying to figure out how to protect and, uh, and secure networks. So we want to take all that learning and apply that to everything we do. Mark, you got it. That? Jeff, we do. We work on that too. I think one of the big issues, though, is especially when you get into some of these more difficult transmission environments, the boundaries of what are normal network processes of what the data center does or or what a carrier does changes. And I think that especially when you're dealing with uh, space-based stuff with high latency, uh, you really need cooperation in the secure part of it. And that's one of the things uh, Yale's been really actually I think sensitive it's to actually, it's with really, Facebook. That's a, it's, a really trick, it's a really difficult question. It's, it it's a really good thing to have made the last question because it underscores the complexity of this challenge, really. I mean, it's not even something that we would necessarily first bring to this. I, I didn't even think of that question, but the fact there's like probably 15 other things like that that have to be fought through in order for the world to really be connected. and they will continue to need to be thought through as the world changes and morphs as a result of the connectivity. So, I mean, if we talk about solving, and we talk about the scale of this challenge, I mean, this needs its own conference. This needs its own series of ongoing, obsessive work, and I'm just so happy that the three of you, at least, are devoting your lives to it, and so thank you for sharing what you're doing with us. Great. David, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, you have been most patient. I know that as great as the conversations are on stage, the best conversations occur out in the halls. So we have a reception for you outside. If you are doing other Solve-related things tonight, grab one of the Solve staff. You can tell them because they have staff written across their back, and they'll tell you where to go. One of the things you've heard throughout the day is these are not just technological problems. They are political problems and economic problems, and we will be discussing that at 8 a.m. sharp on the Solve Pavilion on North Court. Thank you very much for your attention today.